turntablist, producer, and label owner, A-Track leveraged his success as a teenage scratch phenom into a permanent position on the Mount Rushmore of DJs. This is his blueprint. Growing up, how did you make your introduction to hip hop and to our day So I grew up in Montreal. My parents are intellectuals, and I would say that they encourage like an interest in the arts. Neither of my parents makes music, um, but as you know, both my brother and I are in music. My brother, now known as the frontman of Chromio, but at the time was just you know David Makovich. And for both of us, you know, early '90s, '92, '3 was the period where we got into hip hop through, really through the Beastie Boys. Beastie Boys in Cypress Hill. The scratches on the, the Bismarck key, boom, on there. And just hearing that being like, what's that, what's that noise? And that was just hypnotizing to me. My brother would borrow cassettes, starting with the Beasties in Cypress Hill, but then going into Far Side's first album, De La Soul, Balloon, Mind State, Tribe Called Quest, Midnight Marauders, but also Karis One, Return of the Boom Bap, which had a bunch of premiere songs with a lot of scratching. That was kind of our introduction to hip hop. How does a turntable fall into your life? My bro was playing the guitar already, and you know, quickly he was already part of bands, and and uh, and I wanted to find my instrument. I think I just tried it one day, you know. And I remember even my brother and his friends trying it at some point. The way that I think anybody will try scratching, you put a record on your parents' record player, it sounds like trash and you're just like, okay, I can't do it. Except when I tried it by myself after school one day, it didn't sound like trash, it sounded like scratching. And it really became a fixation for me. I would just listen to records that have scratching on them and try to analyze how Premiere is doing this or how Pete Rock is doing that. And I had a very, very serious focus uh, right from the start. And it was very methodical, almost mathematical, where if I understood in my head how a scratch was supposed to be done, I had to teach my hands to do it. By that point, my brother was also hosting a college radio show in Montreal, and through that, I met some local DJs who were participating in the DMC battle you know, before I got into it. One of those DJs was Kid Koala, who's still known to this day, awesome DJ, extremely creative. Um, but there was a lesser known guy called Devious who would invite me to his house. And, you know, by the way, there was a whole process of even explaining to my parents that I'm gonna go hang out at a, in a sort of bad part of town with a guy called Devious, <laughs> you know? And, and uh, my parents were a little worried at first, but they got to meet the guy and he was a very nice guy that he actually wasn't Devious. <laughs> They were trusting, especially as they got to meet the people that I was dealing with and see, also to see what this meant to me. So I really, really found a true passion. And, you know, pretty quickly there started being write-ups in the local papers and things like that, because I would make little appearances at shows, even though I was 14, you know, nowhere near being legally allowed to be in clubs. I was just never, never nervous about it. It didn't take long for me to think that I wanted to enter battles. I didn't even realize that the first battle that I'd enter would make me world champion. Like, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Knowing you as an adult, you have a very sort of mild demeanor. It takes a certain ferocity and competitiveness <laughs> yeah. to win. There's words beyond competitive. Like, I think that I'm overconfident and I think that that's helped me. Like, I've thought about this over time because I've thought back at like, why did I put myself in that situation? It worked out great, but people don't usually do that. The only thing I was thinking about was that I practice enough. And I was a nut with my practice. Like my friends would call me a monk. Like I, it was hours and hours and hours. Um, I remember a day watching me practice one day and say, you know, of course this is the vinyl days and say, all right, cool. What if the needle skips? And I'll just say, well, you know, it skips sometimes when I practice and I usually find the spot that I'm using again. And he would sort of think for a second go, no, run through your routine and I'm gonna surprise you and I'll bang the table when you don't expect it and you have to keep going with it. And I'd be like, okay. And I would run through this set, which is a six minute set. So if you mess up one part, all your timing's thrown off. And yeah, he would <laughs> hit the table and it would make the needle skip and it forced me to prepare myself for the un 
preparable, I guess. Did you, in your heart, expect to win? I went to the World Finals, which were in Italy that year. My mom came with me, because uh, I wasn't going to travel by myself at 15. And as I remember it, and when I look at photos, I was just having the time of my life. I wasn't like sweating buckets like, oh man, I'm gonna face this guy and that guy, and this is like those videos that I watched, which is like, that's the truth. That's actually what was happening. But for me, I was just like, I love scratching. <laughs> and I'm gonna go on that stage and scratch. And I beat all of them. Welcome 15 year old Canadian DJ A-Track. <laughs> All your other DJs are a bunch of jerks. You wanna test me? Are you stupid? All your other DJs are a bunch of jerks. You gotta be out of your fucking mind. All your fucking DJs are stupid. All your stupid DJs you gotta be out of your fucking mind. All your fucking DJs are stupid. All your stupid DJs you gotta be out of your fucking mind. All your other DJs are a bunch of jerks. The flip side of that victory and one of the biggest lessons in my sort of professional career early on was the skepticism and the haters that came with that. Because at the end of the day, I looked like a cute little kid. You know, I was 15, but I looked 10 maybe, I don't know, 11, somewhere around there. Uh, and there's DJs who were practicing for years trying to enter these battles, win these battles, and I came in and just took the trophy home. And I, you know, I think a lot of them were jealous. Rather than just getting bummed out, I would just think, no, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna win more battles. And then if I win more battles, no one's gonna say that I won that one battle because of how I looked. I'm gonna make it so that it's undeniable. My battling years were 97 to 2000. In 2000, I was 18. I was five-time world champion, which was a record at the time. And I decided that would be my last year of battling. The turntablism scene itself was starting to dry out a bit. And there was just less interest out there for scratch DJs compared to how there really was, you know, so much enthusiasm for it for a few years. And a lot of my friends, my DJ friends, who were all at least five years older than me, sort of took that as a cue to change their path a little bit. Some of them got residencies at the local club or some of them went and finished their studies or just sort of like shacked up with wifey or whatever it was. But a lot of the DJs around me slowed down as the scene slowed down. So what was your thought process as you plotted sort of the second act? I remember I really wanted to, uh, I wanted to DJ for Missy Elliott. Probably the best routine that I did just as far as flipping records was with Get Your Freak On by Missy. I always wanted to, to, to mess with her records and that made me think, well, maybe I could be her DJ. But keep in mind, this is a time in the early 2000s where most artists didn't have DJs. I had another routine with uh, Grindin' by The Clips and uh, I met Pusha T in a hotel lobby in LA at the Grafton. And I just <laughs> happened to have a, a camcorder in my bag with footage of what I was doing to his song. And even with that, it wasn't enough to really lead to anything. So I went up to him, hey, what's up, I'm a track I'm a DJ, I'm actually world champion. Oh, cool, nice to meet you. Hey, do you have five minutes? Let me show you a thing. Three minutes. Let me show you this thing that I do with Grindin. Oh, shit. Watch it. Yo, that's crazy. Cool, thanks. Pound. <laughs> that doesn't change my career. It's cool. And like, no fault to him. What, what did I expect him to do, you know? I, I was kind of vaguely looking for someone that could make room for me on their stage, but that's very abstract. Little known fact, there was a brief period where uh, I was hired to DJ for Steve-O from Jackass. His manager used to be a promoter who used to book me and my friends, a couple scratch DJs. So his manager saw me at a show and was like, hey, Chuck, I booked you years ago. Man, you're still great. Like, I want to make produce these DVDs for you and get you on the road and more people need to see what you do. And I was like, yeah, more people need to see what I do. That's right. That's what I've been thinking too. And, <laughs> and I got on the, there was this weird show that I played in Cancun for Maxim Magazine during uh, spring break. It was one of the weirdest days of my life, but it was uh, Steve-O and maybe two of the other jackass guys. And these guys are like stapling their nut sacks and like balancing ladders on their nose and just basically hurting themselves in front of a crowd for a cheer. And then I went up and did a scratch routine and the crowd loved it. And I was like, I knew that there was audiences that have never seen scratching that could dig what I do. I tried working with the Steve-O squad for less than a month. It was very weird. I 
booked myself a flight home. I think we were in Kansas City where I, when I was like, no, no, this, I, this is not the thing that I set out to do. So how did you meet Kanye? So I met Kanye on a fateful trip to, to London. As it turns out, the whole Rockefeller team was in London for a sort of press run. But there's a record shop called Deal Real. They got me to come and, you know, do a little demonstration, a little routine. So, you know, John Legend and I are at the same in-store, and Kanye came to support John, but was, didn't want to get noticed too much, so he's in the corner of the shop with a hoodie over his face. Just there to support his boy, but then he sees me come up, and I do this thing where I flip the sample for just to get by with the Nina Simone sample, and they go into Kanye's instrumental. And as I'm hyper-concentrated going through these really technical tricks, I'm thinking, this guy's into it. I gotta talk to him after this. Um, and then, Mos Def walks in. I don't know why, I don't know why he's in town. Mos Def walks into the store. People go crazy. They start freestyling, people are mobbing into the store, and I'm thinking like, uh, there goes my chance to talk to Kanye West. Shit. So, with the help of Dame's assistant, who was just down to like, connect some dots for me, I hit her up later on and I was like, yo, I need to talk to Kanye. I know he saw my, my little set at the store, and she was like, look, we have a press conference tomorrow. Here's where it is. Just go talk to him. So I go to this press conference with my suitcase. I don't know anyone. And I'm just sort of like waiting in the hopes that I can catch uh, Yay before I go to the airport. And sure enough, he's walking out. And I'm like, yo, I'm the dude from the shop yesterday. And he's, then we start talking. And he's like, yo, that was crazy. You know, I'm, I want to take you on tour. I need a DJ. I'm doing this tour. College Dropout had just came out, right? And so he was about to do his official tour. He's like, I need, a, you know, I need a DJ, I'm gonna take you on the road. And everything came from that. And it, you know, it's funny to think back at it because uh, it feels like there's an element of chance, right? Like what are the odds that Kanye and I would be at the same shop and that John Legend and I would be booked for the same in-store? There's definitely an element of chance. But I also think there's an element of like identifying that moment that could be a pivotal moment for what you do and knowing when you have to just, you know, go for it. A-Track and Kanye began a creative partnership that benefited both greatly, but A-Track never lost sight of his own ambitions. So how does that time on tour with him change your life? In both of our lives, it was seminal periods. And you know, I worked with Ye from right after college dropout to right before 808s. Being a part of those projects, you know, late registration, witnessing the work of John Bryan, but also seeing Kanye's style grow, scratching on Gold Digger, then scratching on the Common Albums, on B and that stuff, and then actually feeding some music that played some sort of influence into the sound of graduation. Uh, you know, I never want to take too much credit on that, but even just being, being in the room and, and, and being a part of the conversation. Kanye was the producer and artist. He was the one that had a vision of what he turned it into, but understanding just how powerful music is and how, you know, one reference can turn into something else that's completely different, but there's a lineage there. So during that period, like 2006 into 2007, you're spending a lot of time with Ye. Yeah. You're starting to play things like Justice and Daft Punk on the side. Mm -hmm. And are you introducing him and the rest of the crew to all of this stuff? Specifically for Justice, for example, like I remember when they had the video for DA and CE that had the animated t-shirt graphics. The Somi one. The, yeah, that Somi made. I sent that video to Kanye, like, yo, my friends made this cool video. And then right away he was like, I need to meet this guy. And I introduced them and then he saw me made the video for, for Good Life. Uh, so some of those were connections that I made, but like, it's tricky for me anytime I do an interview, people try to pull this, yes. pull me to take credit for certain things, And but to be fair, Kanye helped me with just as many things. I would just play him the music that I was working on because even though I was, you know, had this re reputation of being one of the best DJs in the world, I was starting to produce and I, I didn't take for granted that I would be a great producer necessarily. Those are different things. So he would see me with my headphones on in the bus or wherever and he'd be like, oh, let me listen to that. That's what made him get on Pronouns, by the way, the Kid Sister song. I never asked him play, I never asked him like rap on this song that I'm producing. It was just one of those instances of him being like, can I listen? Oh, this is dope. And then like a few days later, like send me that track. At a certain point though, you decided to step off of the Kanye West yeah. show. Um, 
What prompted that? Fool's gold, this, this enterprise was probably the deciding factor, was probably the, the biggest catalyst to that decision. Through my whole stint with Kanye, there was definitely a sense of like, is this the end game for me? Am I just gonna, am I gonna be number two? I've always been extremely grateful to what those, uh, what the experience of working with Kanye brought to me, let alone the fact that he's a dear friend to this day. It also, it gave me the jetpack that I needed to get out of that previous phase of turntablism, which was a sort of product of the backpack era that had lost steam. It put me on stage at the VMAs and the Grammys and, and you know all these other events, let alone just stadiums. I founded Fool's Gold at the beginning of 2007. I quit the Kanye gig at the end of 2007. And I remember when I told him I wanted to talk to him. Obviously, we were on tour. Hey, can I come to your room? Yeah, sure. And like, I walked in and he was like, so you're done. <laughs> like he just knew. So I guess the next chapter sort of begins before the last chapter ends with the creation of Fool's Gold. Yeah. How did that happen? Fool's Gold was born around the time that I started producing music myself a little bit more seriously also. And at a time when I had just moved to New York, I befriended a New York DJ and a journalist called Nick Catchdubs. We were in the same circle of friends where it just seemed like everyone around us was doing something new and really interesting and the establishment wasn't getting it, the big labels weren't getting it. And I just understood that it's not rocket science to press up vinyl and to get records out and that what's important is the community side of it and getting certain key journalists and people to hear it but also a few key DJs and you know that those relationships can really build a strong brand. The aesthetics of Fool's Gold were super important right from the start you know Dust La Rock, Rest in Peace was a uh, a partner of the label for, for, for many years, like not only the in-house art director, but literally had shares. That's how integral he was to Fool's Gold. The same way that you, you know, someone in another era could think, I, uh, I know what, a, what the Def Jam sleeve looks like, or I know what a Stone Throw sleeve looks like, or Mo Wax, or Factory Records. We wanted Fool's Gold to be in that lineage. What is your ambition for, for the record? Our ambition in the beginning for Fool's Gold was to be an extremely consistent, packaging savvy and genreless label run by DJs. And the fact that we're a DJ run label was important because a lot of the early releases fell into this unclassifiable category of club music. We had a few rappers that were experimenting with electronic beats, which at the time was not the norm at all. So we had that and we had electronic music that appealed to hip hop heads. Nick and I knew that as DJs, that all made sense. And not, not only that, but that was the most exciting music at the time. We did our first Fool's Gold tour right from year one in, in the fall. Um, the video for Kid Sister Pro Nails, which was a self-funded and very clever video, uh, had just come out and it was kind of like, you know, setting everything ablaze and we were getting a lot of attention. Cool Kids were part of the fold. Um, we, I think, had just, just, just signed a completely unknown uh, uh, Cleveland guy called Kid Cuddy. And, um, you know, I, I even brought in a few of my European DJ friends to make that bridge, to build that bridge between scenes and to bring that energy of, you know, sweaty indie electronic parties to the morphing hip hop scene and to just toss that into some crazy new thing. So one of the first early breakout successes that you guys had was Kid Cudi's Day and Night, mm -hmm. the, the Crookers remix. Plain Pat brought me Cudi, Day and Night. So I obviously knew Pat through working with Kanye. Um, and so he found Cudi when he was basically unknown uh, and sent me uh, the two songs, Day and Night and That New New. Not even directly asking if I would sign it to Fool's Gold, but just on some like, hey, what do you think of this? I found this kid. And I remember going to Australia for a tour and on the flight back, I kept listening to Day and Night over and over again. And even though there were some quirks and idiosyncrasies to the production style and whatever else that were different from what my ear was accustomed to hearing with hip-hop production and some things maybe were technically wrong 
it was fucking great. And all I know is I, I couldn't stop listening to it. So whatever that thing was, I couldn't, I listened to it on repeat for a very long flight. Those flights are like 12 or 13 hours. Something about that long flight gave me like the, the light bulb when I, when I got back home to think like, we should just put this out, this is great. Day and Night is one of those exceptional records, and I mean that even literally, that I think a lot of people in the music business dream of, where every couple of years there's a song that takes a couple months to creep up, but that becomes uh, a ubiquitous hit off the strength of just the, the originality of the music itself. And you mentioned the Crookers remix, that you know the Crookers heard the song on Fool's Gold's MySpace page <laughs> and asked if we would send them stems and they had an idea for an up-tempo remix of it and they did it for free and when we started selling it um, we gave them a little bit of money and they really didn't ask for much no one knew how big it would get and the thing that was very particular about Day and Night is that both the original version and the electronic remix blew up like a two-headed monster and conquered <laughs> you know these spaces at the same time. It was incredible. Danny Brown is perhaps the artist that you have taken from, you know, uh, the single mixtape world all the way to a full-blown career. Mm -hmm. How did you end up signing Danny? And what was it about him that, you know, he became sort of the marquee artist? Both Nick and I noticed him on some, you know, online, uh, on some websites and interviews. Seeing what he looked like was, part of what piqued my interest. Hearing him talk, hearing him say that he wasn't interested in trying to get a record on the radio, but also seeing, he's got a smile that's really charismatic, hearing his speaking voice and just being like, this guy's a character, you know? And understanding that he's from Detroit, thinking this guy could be like the next Detroit thing after the era of slum and whatnot. As far as like him becoming a marquee artist, yeah. and, and breaking down doors and becoming such a unique character, that was a team effort. The early Fool's Gold Day Off parties, when Danny would perform, half the crowd wouldn't get it. And he and I would have talks after where he would feel sort of unsure about that and just sort of say, I hope I didn't let you guys down. And I'd be like, dude, you're incredible. Like, are you kidding? Just keep doing what you do. It's just gonna keep growing and growing. And that's kind of, that was our role to, 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 to foster that, that trust and that confidence. This is, um, this is the Fool's Gold office, so we're right behind the store. Uh, only select few <laughs> are allowed back here. There's just so many memories of everything that we've been involved with between the events, obviously, obviously some of the releases, five year anniversary party with Ghostface, uh, where the block got shut down because there's too many people and the cops came and put barricades and it was one of those like, growing pains kind of moments. The, the, the Cameron project with uh, actual airbrush artwork, that was- That is the original make. artwork? Yeah. Duck Sauce Vinyl, Danny Brown Triple X, one of the best covers we've ever had. Cuddy, of course, that's the record that we presented to him mm -hmm. uh, and he lost his shit. At this point you're in your late 20s and you got the label, you have your DJ career going on, producing as well. Around the same time, you link with Armin Van Helden and form Duck Sauce. Yeah. And you guys have what is possibly the largest hit of your personal career uh -huh. um, in Barbra Streisand. Uh -huh. Barbra Streisand was a song that, like, Armand and I sat down for maybe a few weeks and made like three or four songs in hopes of finding one of them that would be a single. And Barbara was the one that I would play to my friends. If I would just sit down with my friends and be like, hey, you want to hear the new shit that we got? When I got to that one, I would say, okay, this is the really stupid one. Or just like, hey, listen to this silly thing that we did, or this, you know, whatever adjective I'd use, but just like, check this out, we're stupid. When we made that song, I think I was on the floor laughing for about 15 minutes. When we get, like got that loop going the way that it was, and that voice sounded just the way that it did, and it had that cadence that just felt like it belonged there, and it doesn't matter if it doesn't fit the format of what's on the charts. We, we were number one in 12 countries. It was like a CeeLo fuck you and Swedish House Mafia won and um, I forget which Bruno Mars song and Barbra Streisand. Those were the three or four songs that were on the top of the charts in every country in the world. And I would just look at that and be like, this is so weird, it's a loop. The song's a loop, it makes no sense. But, you know, 
So I was, I was proud of that because it felt there was something punk rock about that. Around this time, 2008, 2009, DJs in general start to step to the forefront. You as one of the sort of emissaries of this movement. Ever since I was a kid scratching, it was so important for me for DJing to have legitimacy. And when EDM exploded in North America, we finally got it. Rather than getting hung up over, you know, some sides of it that maybe weren't the, the version of DJing that I like or whatever else, my thing was like, hey, we finally got people's eyeballs. Like, we, this is the moment now. We got people's attention. Everybody wants in on this. I would be a hypocrite to wish for that for, you know, 15 years prior and then to suddenly be like, uh, but I don't like the way that it played out. No, fuck it. It's great. DJ culture. And that's what the idiom really is. DJ culture conquered the world. And to me, that was exciting. Has that bubble burst? I think what happened was there was a speculation bubble. And with that, a lot of like, there was a certain, there was a B team maybe. Like there was a lot of also rands. And I think uh, maybe there was a bit of a filtering process where only the ones that have something unique to offer still have their footing. Um, it's just that now in the bigger picture, hip hop is dominant, which I'm thrilled about because hip hop is my fucking life. After the EDM explosion, the once child star assumed a new role as the elder statesman of the culture. <laughs> you travel the world by yourself. Yeah. Um, you have complete control over everything that you do in the performance. And now you have uh, a staff mm -hmm. forming around you. How did you think about the management of that and, you know, dealing with artists and all of those sort of sticky parts of the business. Dealing with employees, dealing with internal company dynamics and friction between this person and that person um, was, you know, like, you, like you're like you hinting, was a new thing for me to deal with. And also dealing with, heart, with artists who naturally are creators and, and who are maybe fragile because they're putting themselves on the line. And I learned a lot of lessons along the way. If you think about it, for the first half of my career, I was the young kid. I went from hanging out with my older brother and his friends to hanging out with my DJ friends who were 10 years older than me, to working with Ye and his friends who were basically my brother's age. And then around the time that I founded Fool's Gold and I started putting on people, and I myself was, you know, going over the hump of the mid 20s, I started noticing some, some even more and more people calling me big bro or just like looking at me for advice. That became more of a constant, you know, in the fool's gold chapter in my life, which is the last 10 years, which was like me realizing that I'm not the little bro anymore. And that there's like generations and generations that are coming in and that I can help just be there for them and, and answer some questions and, and, you know, hopefully steer them the right path. As you look at your personal finances, mm. are you, are things just falling into place? Or, or, I mean, how are you approaching that? Even way before Fool's Gold, I was making decent money off of DJing. And to, to this day, I guess I can say, I don't know if I've ever said this publicly, I've never taken a salary from Fool's Gold. This company is not how I make money. This company is how I get cool ideas out. I make my money being a track and occasionally that involves duck sauce or whatever else. I didn't grow up in a household where money was an end goal at all. So when you grow up not having an excess of money, and when you start making your own money, at least in my case I could say, early on I was uh, cautious with it, careful with it, started putting some money away right from the start. I always wanted to responsibly build a structure where I can do what I want to do and have the means to do what I want to do. As a label boss, um, obviously, every artist that you deal with is convinced that they are the next. <laughs> yeah, whatever they should. Has it been tough on you emotionally, you know, what, when those people are left feeling let down by the outcome? If an artist puts out something on Fool's Gold and it doesn't blow up as much as we all hope it would, my sort of MO is just, what's the next move? Let's plan the next project. Or is there still something we can do with this project to work it in a different way? Maybe that's just something with the way I approach all of what, what I do. You're gonna have failures. Certain projects that you or the team or whoever can labor over the most 
might be the ones that are just the, it's the hardest egg to hatch and it just doesn't quite come out as gracefully. And there's other things that just happen extremely naturally and that just connect and people feel that uh, the contagious aspect of that spontaneity and that really connects too. And you kind of just have to accept that there's a lot of things out of your control on whether or not something connects or hits or sells or whatever your you know, barometer is. But also you have to accept that, that uh, that's part of the game. How do you maintain sort of your contact with the cutting edge of what's going on? I have to research new music. That feeds my DJing and that feeds Fool's Gold signings. And that just feeds the knowledge that I have to always keep up. And I can never let that slip. And um, I remember in my earlier days as a hip hop fan, being sort of scared of change. In particular, you know, I'm such a child of the DJ Premier era. I'm such a child of Boom Bap. And when like keyboard beats started appearing, that sounded so wrong to me in the beginning. But when I realized that I was clinging on to one paradigm and that, that it's wrong to do that in music, especially as a DJ, I think I was ashamed of that. And, and, and you know, I never wanted to make that mistake again. There's a way to still be critical because my job isn't to like everything and just be like, oh, our kids are so cool. I still have to have an opinion and to find the stuff that has substance or that has originality or whatever else, but to at least understand what's making, you know, if something's making waves, why? How's it connecting? So this year you debuted uh, the first annual Goldie Awards. Yeah. Which sort of brings things full circle as Definitely. you the DMC champion put on your own DJ battle. The whole idea of Goldie Awards was, you know, filling a void um, in the sort of DJ ecosystem. On one hand, like I know just how much winning those battles in my early years established my rep, got my name on the map. And I also know specifically when that scene lost people's interest and sort of like thinned out. So for me, the exercise in throwing the Goldie Awards was not just to manage to organize a DJ battle, period, but it was a sort of reconnecting of the dots, whereby, you know, I know the audience that comes to my Fool's Gold events, and I know how a DJ battle is due to be updated. And I just had to connect all of that. For me, it felt like the most important milestone in, in the last many years of what I've done because it's so, it, it's so deeply significant to me. And, you know, when you were talking about, you know, the boom of EDM and whether that bubble may have burst a little bit or at least the sort of readjustments that DJs as personalities have been going through this past year in the public eye, I felt like that it was a perfect window to, to insert a place where the true authentic craft of DJing can be celebrated and encouraged and just like ground it, really ground the whole thing with a very strong foundation. As you get older, does life on the road become more difficult? I feel like there was a point, maybe in my mid to late 20s, where I started feeling like, oh man, I'm messed up. <laughs> Coming home from a tour and being messed up. And by the way, like even the, the sort of what it does to your psyche, the mental side of it, just coming home bummed out sometimes and just being like, why am I bummed? And then you realize like, oh yeah, fatigue will do that. Fatigue will fuck with your mood. So the only thing that I've learned is recent, in recent years is to try to balance it out. I'm just okay with the whole thing. Like, like I, I do what I love for a living. Um, it's constantly challenging. Yeah, I just love the fuck out of DJing. In general, I will say that the entertainment business and music as a whole is designed to give people like myself or any, anyone that makes music a career normally of like five years. The challenge is longevity. And the way to overcome that challenge, I think, or at least I've found, is this sort of constant reinvention. I always think of where the path is going and you know what I did before and what I'm about to do next. And that's why none of the new elements that come into what I'm doing are ever too much off course because I know I know the story. I'm writing the story. 